At just 25 years old, Zach Gallen has already established himself as one of the best pitchers in the National League and the co-author of the D-backs' brightest moment this season when Gallen and Madison Bumgarner both blanked the Braves on a doubleheader Sunday in Atlanta. Gallen gets the complete game shutout, one hitter. However, Zach Gallen's professional career began with a lot of uncertainty. He fulfilled a lifetime dream when he was drafted by his beloved boyhood team, the St. Louis Cardinals, only to be traded to Miami a year later. Shortly afterward, Gallen was traded again, this time to the Diamondbacks. Gallen grew up in New Jersey and finally stopped feeling like a baseball nomad only after arriving in Arizona. That's when he met the GM who just traded for him, Mike Hazen, a Boston native who shares Gallen's East Coast sensibility. I remember the first time I met Hayes, he, he was sitting in Tori's office and he's drenched in sweat eating a Chipotle bowl and he goes, <laughs> and I, I'm like, all right, that's, that's interesting. And he goes, um, he said, I just traded my number one prospect for you. Don't screw this up. That and sounds that, like Hayes. And in that moment, I said, this is exactly where I need to be. This is the, there's no other spot where I need Why? to be. Why? What just, made you say that? Just because, like, I could just tell the Northeast. Like, I didn't even know he was from the Northeast. That, like, I just was like, this is, this is my kind of guy. Like, I'll go to war for that guy. Um, really? So when you get that from an organization, when the, an organization articulates that to you and says, hey, we traded for you, this is what you can be, what does that do for you going back toward the Diamondbacks? Like, how does that make you feel about the organization? Yeah, no, it, it's, it, it was an awesome feeling. Um, it was just, the, the, the crazy thing about being traded is, it's like, are you wanted or are you unwanted? You know what right. I mean? So like one team wants you, but another team's like, eh, we don't necessarily want you anymore. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, at that point in time in my career was, it was a crazy just, because I'd been traded twice now in, in three years. So it was like, all right, well, I mean, is this going to be the what? norm now? It's like every 18 right. months, I'm going to just bounce around. Um, what did that do to your head? I mean, the first one, getting traded from St. Louis to Miami was just tough because I grew up a Cardinals fan. So it was Mark just McGuire like, was yeah, your guy, right? Exactly. So I was, I had always grown up thinking I'm going to get the Bush Stadium. Like I'm going to play in Bush Stadium. Um, and granted, you have a one in 30 shot of getting drafted by the Cardinals and, and putting on that uniform. Um, but yeah, that was just like, that, that was my childhood dream. And they get traded to Miami. And then you get to you know play for my idol, uh, which was was another cool thing. But yeah, it was it was definitely a weird period of you know my boyhood team, and then my boyhood idol are like, yeah, we don't necessarily want you anymore. You got it. We're gonna send you out west. So that definitely added another chip chip on the shoulder. So the idol was Jeter. Jeter. So yeah, yeah, that's the first time I've heard. I heard Jordan. I knew I knew McGuire. Yeah. I knew Jordan. Yeah, yeah. A New Jersey Jeter is not. A, it's not a big reach. Nope. I, I'll tell you where the transition happened was. Growing up, I wore 25, and then we moved for McGuire. Yeah, for McGuire, and then my dad. My dad actually coached the Yankees. Like you know, whatever. When I was growing up, it was my brother's favorite team. We moved. I think I was 11. I guess it was. We moved, and one of the guys on the team already wore 25. So they were like. You got to pick a new number. I'm like, and Dev I had when you're a kid, that's devastating. Devastating. Yeah. I mean, I had like identity <laughs> crisis at like 11 years old, being like, oh, now like what what number is this wear? And I went through the whole the whole gamut. It was zero, one, you know, two, whatever, 99. Which has become the typical Zach Gallen investigative journalism approach yeah. to everything you do. Yeah, it was kind of funny that it was one, two, and 99, like opposite ends of the spectrum. And I don't know why I wanted to pick 99, but I was like, I think I'm gonna go with two. Like, I, I just like two. Um, I was kind of like growing into to becoming like a shortstop and like just love Derek Jeter. So I was gonna, I wore two all the way from 11 through high school, and I was supposed to wear it at Carolina. Other than the fact that the equipment manager who was there actually took another job at South Carolina. So like the coaches there was like, hey, like I just want to wear number two. If it's open, that's fine. If not, not a big deal. Um, and it was open. And we got a new equipment manager, and I walk in the first day, and I'm like, oh man, like, I'm gonna have number two, and I'm in the back corner, and I'm number 38. <laughs> and I'm Ooh. like, I was like, oh man, I'm like 38. All right, I guess we gotta, you know, I'm like, I can't be some 17 year old kid being like, hey, I wanna change my number. Um, so yeah, it was, I wore 38, and then my sophomore year, 23, you know, became open. Yeah, well, look, 23 at Carolina, like, do you have to fill out a form? Yeah. Like, what do they make? You, what do they make you do? <laughs> yeah, you would think that it's it's locked up in the back, but it was. Right? Yeah, our assistant pitching coach was was wearing it, 
and then somebody left that had his number, so he took that number, and then 23 became open, and I was like, yeah, I think it would be pretty cool to wear 23 in Carolina Blue, so it was kind of a no-brainer. And now you're 23 now. And now I'm 23 now. I don't want to make too much, of, <laughs> too big a deal about the hair, but I'm, I'm on board. Yeah. And I know, I think you said you cut it maybe once in the off season for a wedding or something. I might be making that up. Yeah, I think, uh, I, so I cut it once in January of 2020, and then once again <laughs> in no, November of 2020. And I actually just got a trim yesterday. Whoa! So, yeah. For this show? Just because I needed to clean it up. All right. It was getting too long, too. No, 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 no. No, I had it. It was getting a little on Kent, so I was like, you know, what? I'm gonna go get it trimmed up, clean it up, look presentable. So yeah, but the length I'm attached to it. So I like it. See, yeah. it's a thing now. Yeah. So you got to go with it. Right? I have to go with it. Yeah. All right. I want to. I want to show you this one thing. But have you ever heard of a, a pitcher named Ross Grimsley? The name sounds familiar. He's 70s, 80s, before your time. Yeah. Expos. He was an All-Star, 20-game winner, and. For me, when I see this look, <laughs> look at this. That's it right now, there. Now, he's a lefty, yeah. but that's you. That, I if mean, you that pitch works. for the Expos. Yep. So he has the hat. I used to just tuck it back when I got the hat on. I tuck it back, but that's curly just like it. What do you think? I think we can market this. Hey, that works. I mean, he's a 20-game winner and an all-star. I'll take it. So there you go. <laughs> so Ross Grimsley's now on your radar. All right. Has there been discussion, debate about, okay, do we, because when you first got here, you were the clean cut kid. Yeah. This look is like much more sort of cool, laid back dude yeah. kind of a thing. I think it was just a product of the environment. It was going from Miami where it was, you know, not really long hair was, they kind of went with the Yankees theme, so. Well, Jeter. Just, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you were pre-Jeter, right? No, I was, uh, Jeter came in October and I was traded in December, I think it was. So like, right, the new regime or whatever. So yeah, it was clean shaven, and I was like, ah, oh, you know what? And then the hair was just like, all right, quarantine. I'm not gonna see anybody, so I'll just let it go. <laughs> it was like, no, I think we I all could, did that. And I could wear a hat, like it doesn't matter. So yeah, I finally was like, all right, I'm just gonna do it and just grow it out. And now I've gotten three haircuts in two years, so here we are. <laughs> awesome. I remember going from the Northeast to to North Carolina, where a lot of the you know Southerners are, are very welcoming and and kind hearted. And, sure. You know, you just kind of tell them how it is, and they kind of take a step back and like, whoa, I didn't expect that. We haven't had a lot of great moments this year. It's been a tough season. You've had a tough season with the injuries, but you were part of maybe the best day of the season in Atlanta, that April 25th, the back-to-back the -back complete games in one day, you and Mad Bum. What do you remember about that day? Yeah, that was that was a crazy day. We got rained out, I think it was. So that's yeah, why the we day had before. Yeah. yeah, so I I was under the impression that I was going to pitch the second game. So I'm thinking, all right, you know, get you know my routine, come in and you know whatever inning it was. And then Herji calls me and he's like, you're actually starting the first game now. And I was like, oh, all right, okay, that's fine, whatever. So through the first game, you know, and I I didn't even know like the no hit like when Cole dove for that ball in the outfield, I was like. What's he diving for? Like, not even real. I told him that in the dugout, and he was like, I was leaving it all out there for you. But no, that, that day was just crazy, and I remember um, Bum said something along the lines of like, hey, you know, nice job, like, whatever. And then after the game, I said to him, I said, you had to show me up? And he was like, I would have rather taken the one hitter. He's like, I didn't want to have to talk to the media. And I was like, okay, that's fair enough. But yeah, so it was, it, the whole day was just cool. I felt like the stuff was working pretty good that day, so it was, That'll be one of you know the more memorable moments in my career. Gallon gets the complete game shutout, one hitter. I've heard interviews where you said you were a little under underappreciated is the wrong word, but under the radar. Like you weren't the first pick, you weren't drafted out of high school, so there was a little bit of hey, I've been overlooked here. What did you do with that? That's kind of mostly where a lot of the fire comes from. And I mean, I don't know if this is just how, how I'm wired of like just thinking I'm better than what I actually was or, you know, whatever it was. But yeah, just growing up, I'm like, I, I went against that guy or I faced that guy and I won that battle or whatever it was. So for me, it was kind of like, you know, the, the size, the velo, it all just kind of played in the factor of being under the radar. But yeah, it was just, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go out there and 
prove to myself that I can, you know, I'm good as I think I am, and, and prove to everyone else. So it was always kind of that chip on chip on my shoulder. And not to mention, being from the Northeast, you kind of had the chip on your shoulder. Oh anyway. yeah. So it's like, but yeah, it was just kind of, okay, like you're not gonna give me enough love. I'll just show you next time I go out, and the next time I go out. So yeah. You're right. That's a Northeast thing because because yeah. I'm from Boston, you're from New Jersey. Yeah. People will ask me where I'm from, and I'll say Boston, and they'll go, oh, well, that explains it. I'm like, whoa, what? Like, do you get that out here? Uh, not as much here. I, I got it when I was in college. I think I was a little bit more, uh, I don't know if I'd say rough around the edges, but more sure. of just kind of like, I'm going to tell you what I think, like not necessarily mince words. So as I've gotten older, I've understood that you got to be a little bit more diplomatic about it and kind <laughs> of, but yeah, no, I, I, I remember going from the Northeast to, to North Carolina where a lot of the you know southerners are, are very welcoming and, and kind-hearted and sure you know you just kind of tell them how it is and they kind of take a step back and like whoa I didn't expect that so yeah at first it was uh, people gave me oh I, I get it I get you're from New Jersey um, yeah like okay now we understand yeah so what is Summerdale like small town it's it's very blue-collar um, you know it was one of Typical town of like kind of everyone knew, you know, what was going on. It's right outside Philly, right? Yeah, it's probably, I'd say 20 to 25 minutes from Philadelphia. It's just a small town. I grew up like any other kid, just, you know, going out to the field. My dad was a little league coach. My brother's almost nine years older than me, so I was at the field watching him play. Um, yeah, I, I couldn't ask for more. It was like, all right, as soon as the street lights come on, then you gotta come home. So yeah, it was like, as soon as I got home from school, it was out on the field doing whatever. That's the universal signal out east, right? When the sun in the summertime, yeah. oh, lights are on, gotta get home. Yeah, and then depending on, I guess, with like daylight savings time or whatever, this, the lights would go on a little bit earlier. So then you'd maybe get like an extra hour. And then my dad would, my dad had this, well, still does, I, I imagine, this super loud whistle. So like anywhere you were, like kind of <laughs> in the neighborhood of, he would whistle and you kind of, your ears would perk up and then he'd whistle again like, okay that's my time there I gotta go home now so yeah I mean he'll still do it to to this day he'll just kind of give me a little whistle like you know to let me know he's at the game or where you know oh really yeah, yeah that's kinda, cool so yeah. you can hear it out there yeah not as so much anymore but when I was in college or in high school he would just like give me a whistle like you know whenever it was you know one of the like in between innings or something like that just to let me know he's watching that's cool yeah what do they do, your parents? Uh, my mom is actually an office manager and personal assistant for a, a law firm for the senior lawyer. And my dad actually works at UPS. He's coming up on retirement here, and I think in the next year or so. He's been there a while. So they've been awesome, super supportive, and, and, and made this whole thing work growing up of, you know, with not much means, um, but, you know, knowing that this is something I wanted to do. So they were like, hey, we're going we're to make it work. So does that carry over now? Because a, a kid that grew up like that suddenly is in the big league, so now I can get whatever I want. Do you still no, I adhere to the old principles? <laughs> yeah, I definitely would still live, um, you know, like like I'm on a, a, a minor league budget. Granted, it'll be some things that, that I'll splurge on and, and whatnot now, but no, I still kind of just live pretty frugally, I guess you could say. Although, I will say, those are pretty awesome. <laughs> See, now these are the things that I tend to splurge on. So that's cool, but they, you know, just little things just here and there. Those little, are unbelievable. Yeah, these uh, these are the first the first day out of the box today. So. Whoa, for the show. For the We're show, honored. yeah, that's exactly. pretty cool. So I figured I would I would bring a little something, um, <laughs> you know. But yeah, no, those those shoes are something I grew up, you know, being a Michael Jordan fan, and my brother was, you know, had Jordan, so it was like for me, it was like. All right, that's the one thing. Once you know, once you have some some change in your pocket, you can buy some shoes, and you know. So that's kind of my my thing. He shows me the grip. What I think he shows me is the grip that I, you know, now use. So we're throwing, and he's like, "Hey, that's pretty good." He's like, "How are you gripping now?" I was like, "Like you showed me." He's like, "That's not how I showed you." And I was like, "Okay, so I guess I just taught myself a new pitch." So how did you first discover that you were pretty good at pitching? Because you're not, you're, as we've said, you're not a, you're an athlete, but you're not a big six foot four power right-hander Garrett Cole. You're not Pedro Martinez with these freakishly long yeah, fingers, right. right? So when did you first like pick this up and go, hey, I can do some things with this? To be honest with you, I don't remember. It's, it was so long. I think I've just always had a knack 
for pitching, really. It's just growing up on the field, trying to emulate everything that my brother and his teammates and his friends did of being like, I, I want to do that one day, I want to do that. Um, my fingers weren't big enough, and I was so learning here, can to throw. You, how did you, when you were a kid, now we're picturing your hand at <laughs> so like eight, like, nine, like ten this, years old. Right? Yeah. Um, so growing up, like, you know, it was my fingers weren't big enough, so it was kind of just throwing a two-seamer. Yeah, so like your normal two-seamer obviously is, is like this standard, I guess I should say, but my fingers weren't big enough, so we had a somebody, my dad had somebody come help out with practice one day, and we were talking about, you know, two-seamers, and I was like, you know, it feels a little weird, so I'm gonna try this. And then as my hands got bigger, it just started to feel more comfortable of having those three fingers just down the train tracks, I guess, as you could say. So it's like a three-finger two-seam. Yeah, and like a lot of people were like, oh, is it a circle change? Because like, but not really, it was just, so I, is that the change-up grip right there right, right here? Now? Yeah. yeah. So I, there was one day playing catch with my dad. I was probably no older than 10. This had to be eight, nine years old. And I just grabbed it, and I was like, this feels kind of comfortable, and just started throwing it. And since then, it was just like, I forget what it was. I brought it to practice one day for like, hey, you practice? And my coach was like, that's pretty good. Like, what? you know, we're going to start throwing that more. And then, you know, as I got older, it was just, you know, trying to develop that pitch. Swing and a miss. There's the changeup. Strikeout number four for Zach. I know that the changeup is, in a sense, the signature pitch. If there is one, you throw so many. But I know the cutter is one that has constantly evolved for you and at times has been a really important pitch for you. Yeah. How, can you discuss a little bit about how that pitch has evolved for you? Because I've heard you, I mean, I heard you tell Pitching Ninja. I, I just can't say the word slide. <laughs> yeah, I can't. It's, it's just, I, it's, for me, conceptually, it's tough. Um, I'll give you the I'll give you a condensed version of so I go to the Cape I think it's my freshman year Chatham yeah in Chatham oh I love the Cape isn't place. it great oh it's the best you I pitched there one year two, two years I Chatham went, both times yeah yeah my the first year I was was my first year in college baseball and through the most things I've thrown like just I was exhausted and you know whatever <laughs> I, I said to my mom I was like I don't, I'm kind of tired like I I can like really use a break I'm thinking I'm gonna get you know my first summer at home or whatever and she's like this is something you've always wanted to do why not just go like and see like you know if you're tired like whatever like then you know you just reassess <laughs> and she called like a week later and she's like what do you think I said yeah I'll see you in August <laughs> I'm not coming home yeah the Cape uh, Cape Cod in the summer is hard to beat yeah it's tough I met some of my best friends um, you know up there playing the the town is awesome the the, the yeah. people like it's just a great place but one of the guys on my team Paul Cavelli was he actually played at a D2 up there Franklin Pierce New Hampshire yeah great right? we yeah. were playing catch one day and and I'd gone up there with, as I like to call it, in my first year in the ACC, I had one and a half pitches. I had a <laughs> fastball and then either a changeup, a slider, or a curveball. Like some, like it was always just heater and then, you know, just figure out what else we got. And I learned very quickly it was, it was tough to do that in the ACC with, with one pitch. So I'm up there and he's, he's throwing this, you know, what he called was a cutter. And I'm, you know, how do you grip that? So from like 60 feet away, he shows me the grip and... What I think he shows me is the grip that I, you know, now use. So we're throwing, and he's like, hey, that's pretty good. He's like, how are you gripping now? I was like, like, you showed me. He's like, that's not how I showed you. And I was like, okay, so I guess I just taught myself a new pitch. So two weeks go by in that season, I'm like, all right, I think I'm ready to kind of, like, use this now in the, in the, you know, one of the outings. Used it, and I was getting some swings. I think, you know, it was something new that teams weren't expecting. And then, yeah, just over the years of just trying to learn how to manipulate it, get better at locating it, adding depth, you know, taking away depth, like whatever it is, um, just trying to have as many weapons as possible. Once you are stagnant in this game and, and think you've figured it out, you've lost, you're done. Um, so yeah, for me, it's just kind of this constant process of evolving and like, I, I'm just obsessed with pitching. impression is that you're constantly in and talking with Tori and other and Hergy it's like this guy is always learning he's always looking at tape he's talking to guys like you're yeah. a student of your craft yeah we more I, so it seems than most guys I think for me it's just like I I, I love pitching and the craft of pitching um, I think probably the the biggest thing and the most down to the core reason would be people always talk about you know hate to lose more than you love to win type sure. of deal for me it's like I hate to suck more than I like to be good <laughs> you know what I mean so it's always like if I can keep evolving it's that that's that's the ideal for me is being like okay you know I might see the Dodgers on you know whatever day it is August 1st whatever let's uh, pick a random day right the next time I go out there 
I wouldn't mind having, you know, let's say it's a month later, having another weapon and, you know, having something that they're like, hey, he's, he's the, the cutter's got depth today or he's doing something different. So for me, it's always just trying to evolve. So you're looking for new weapons all the time? All the time. And like, I, I think the biggest thing, and Tori and I talk about this a lot, is like once you, once you are stagnant in this game and, and think you've figured it out, you've lost, you're done. So yeah, for me, it's just kind of this constant process of evolving and like, I, I'm just obsessed with pitching. Ross, our, our director of pitching, um, and you know, Fitz, uh, like, are, are good, I, they're good avenues I can go to of being like, hey, I, I, I really would, you know, like to be able to see this, or I would like to be able to see that. Um, and they get back to me with that information, and you know, not to mention, you know, Heron, Dan Heron's like, the, the scouting reports, he's like, you know. He's the secret weapon, isn't he? Nobody knows about Dan Heron, but he does an unbelievable job. Talking, I'm just yeah, 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 right, yeah, yeah. Cut the cameras. Yeah. <laughs> but no, uh, yeah, Dan, he's, he's awesome. Just one, from the surface level, being able to pick his brain about what it's like being out there, and two, to have a guy who played in the big leagues for 15 years write your scouting reports of being like, hey, this is, this is what I used, and, or this is how I think you should use, you know, whatever, has been awesome. And Fitzy, I mean, most guys, here comes the MIT guy with the computer. Some guys might run away, but you're like, oh, let's get into it. Yeah, exactly. But Fitz is not your, is not your typical, no, you no. know, he's like, Fitz is actually the first guy I met when I got traded here. He's the one that picked me up, took me to Salt River to get really? my throat. Oh, yeah. that's funny. Yeah, he took me to, to Chop Shop to get some breakfast and then took me around Salt River just to show me what the deal was. And then just talking about, you know, different things. And, and he's the first guy here that really instilled that, like, confidence of being like, Hey, I I like really think you know you you have a shot to do something you know really special with your career. Like the first thing when I got here with, with Fitz, we sat down in the the coach's conference room and he was like, "This is what I see when I looked at your stuff before we traded for you," and he's like, "And this is what I think it can translate to." And I'm like, "Okay, that that makes sense of of whatever I'm doing is working, and you're gonna just be like, hey, let's just keep doing it, let's get it better, let's get it better." So yeah, I think it was just mostly just that validation of, "Hey, we're I think we can do something really cool here."